Well, I want to start this morning in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. And uh, how many believe we're in the last days? If we look at everything according to prophetic timeline from Scripture, some of the things we see happening around us, we're very, it's very clear that we're living in the end days. And uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 says, Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly, say clearly, that in the last time, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. Pretty strong word. All right? And um, he's really, what, what Paul is doing, he's telling Timothy that there are teachings, uh, there's spirits that bring deceptive doctrines into the church. And, of course, Paul is speaking to the church the New Testament is written to the church. Timothy is a book written for leadership in the church. So Paul is speaking to the church. Amen? In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, he says to, uh, warning Timothy, he says, You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people uh, will only love themselves and their money. That's a, that's a serious, serious thing that we see today. They will be boastful. They're going to be proud, scoffing at God. Have you ever heard anyone scoff at God? Disobedient to parents and ungrateful, they will consider nothing sacred. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. You know, you can't, you can't impose what you think truth. There's nothing sacred anymore. There's nothing holy anymore. We're living in this day, all right? They will be unloving and unforgiving. How many know any unloving or forgiving people? They will, be, they will slander others. They'll have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends. They'll be reckless. They'll be puffed up with pride. Okay? Um, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. And this is what I want to focus on today because I think everything, everything pivots on this last point here is that th they will act religious. People can act religious, but they reject the power of God that is able to make them holy. How many know we need the power of God to make us holy? We can't get holy on our, on our own. How many have tried? It doesn't work, does it? I mean, we need the power of God in our lives to transform us from the inside out. This is not a, th a works-based faith. This is a faith that we trust on God, and the Spirit of God empowers us to do works for God, but we're saved by faith. Amen? Amen. Okay, so I want to I I look at this. We cannot reject the power of God because in 2 Peter, and I'm going to give you guys lots of scripture today because I'm doing a little bit of a Bible study. Now, the reason why is because I was checking some statistics out. They say now that only 51% of pastors in North America actually hold to a biblical view. For, so that's 49% of pastors don't believe the whole Bible anymore. And, and the illiteracy, biblical illiteracy rate in, in, in Christendom is off the charts. It's like... 11% of Christians actually read their Bible. It's crazy. And I'll share all the stats and details. I don't have them this week. But, but there's biblical illiteracy. And so we need to sometimes just go back and just read Scripture upon Scripture, precept upon precept, to make sure that we're going down the right path. Does that make sense? And so 2 Peter 1, verse 2 and 3 says, Grace and peace be multiplied. Say multiplied. See, God's not into just addition and subtraction. God's into multiplication. He likes to just throw it on, all right? And what he's saying here is grace and peace be multiplied to you in what? In the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Next verse, okay? As his divine power, say divine power, has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, past tense. See, this is the thing. When you're reading the Bible, you got to always look. Is it present tense, past tense, or future tense? And right now, it's already been done. When you got born again and you gave your heart to Jesus, God had given you the Spirit, right? Past tense, you already have what you need packaged on the inside that pertains to living a good life, okay? And how? 
has he given us this? Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. All right? And so the two things that we need as believers is we need grace and we, we need truth. Say grace and truth. Okay? This is really, really important. Grace is God's divine influence upon your heart. We always hear preachers talking about grace and say, grace is God's unmerited favor. That's actually a wrong interpretation because that's the, the, the Old Testament word for grace is unmerited favor. The New Testament word grace is God's divine influence upon your heart. So when we talk about grace in the New Testament, it, grace is the power that makes us overcomers in life. Amen? Grace is the power that gives you the ability to change and to transform and to love your neighbor and not kill them when you want to, you know, and th those kind of things that God empowers us by his spirit. That's what grace is. It's, it's, it's not this, this unmerited favor that we talk. It is, but it isn't in full context, okay? And so the knowledge of him who called us, it, when we get more knowledge of him, capital M being the father, um, power is released, in our lives. Does that make sense? And so it's so important that we are building a knowledge of who God is according to the word of God. Why? Because as we build our knowledge, divine power is released in us so that we can live godly lives. If we, if we, if we, if we miss the knowledge, if we get false knowledge, we're, we're going to end up in a bad place, okay? So the enemy can't separate you from the love of God. Say, the devil can't separate me from the love of God. Paul was very clear. He says, nothing can separate me. And he begins to list all these things that could try to... He says, nothing can separate me from the love of God. But you need to know this, that the enemy can separate you from knowing his love. Experientially understanding and knowing the love of God because the love of God casts out all fear because fear involves torment. And the opposite of faith is fear. So if the enemy can get you in fear, you won't have faith to enter the promises of God and do what God's called you to do. So it's so important that we're not motivated by fear. Can I hear an amen? Okay. So, so God wants you to have a revelation of his perfect love for you. And what the enemy wants to do now that you're a believer, now that you belong to God and he can't separate you from God, is he wants to hijack your process. He wants to hijack your heart. We all know about hijacks. We hear about hijacking. We hear about terrorism. We hear about all these things, and we see it on the news. Hijacking is a serious thing. And a hijacker is a person who illegally seizes a vehicle while in transit and forces it to go in a different direction or uses it for their own purposes. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm in the process of being transformed from glory to glory. I'm in the process of having my mind renewed. I'm in the process of being transformed into the image of God's dear son. I'm in a process of transformation because when I see him, I'll be like him. God is, God is transforming us day by day. We're becoming more and more like him. We're going from glory to glory to glory, and we're growing in our God. And our stories of yesterday are supposed to turn into glories for tomorrow. And what happens is the enemy comes, and he tries to hijack your process, and he tries to come in and, and, and invade your space. So what are we going to do about it? In order to understand how the enemy hijacks, exactly, I like that. The, 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 in order to understand how the enemy hijacks our process, we need to understand the battlefield. We need to understand it. And the battlefield is very clear in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5. Paul is speaking, and what does he say? He says, hey, he says, our weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, they're not natural. But they're mighty. Say mighty. Through God. Not through our own strength. They're mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. And, and what is a stronghold? A stronghold is a place that's been fortified to protect against attack. And when you become a Christian, there's, there's worldly thinking. There's humanistic thinking. There's thought patterns that have been built up in your mind. And they fortify against you to keep you from going into your destiny. But I got news. The power of God can break it down. Amen? A stronghold is a place dominated by a particular group. A stronghold is a marked place 
by a particular characteristics. For example, when we talk about politics, if you travel through the states, go from state to state, some states have uh, we would call a democratic stronghold. Other states have a Republican stronghold. And you know because when you walk, go, you're going from state to state, how many have traveled through the states? And you stop to get gas or go to, uh, go to eat or something, and you walk in, either Fox News is on or what's the other one? CNN, right? And from state to state. And, and the people, for majority of the people, think the same way because it's a mind stronghold, whether Republican or Democrat. Does that make sense? Same way here with liberals and conservatives. There's mindsets, but God wants us to have a mindset of heaven because we're not of this world. Amen? And so look what he says. Our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations or arguments in the New King James, and every high thing that exalts itself against knowledge of God. And then it says, bring every thought, say every thought. thought. Not just some, bring every thought into the examination room. And say, is this, is this thought in obedience to Christ? That's what we need to do as Christians. Examine our thoughts, okay? So, here's the thing. The word imaginations. How do, how do we word it? Go back one verse in the, in the New King James. Casting down. Uh, go up next one. Next verse. Yeah. Casting down arguments. That word arguments is the same word imaginations. And that word actually means reasonings or conscience. And a conscience is actually this, an inner feeling or a voice as acting as a guide to right or wrong in regards to your behavior. That's what conscience is. And I want to say this, your conscience can actually be hijacked by the enemy. A feeling or a voice that's acting to guide you in right or wrong. And it's based on the information you bring in and you reason in your mind will create a conscience. I'm telling you right now in regards to Islamic extremists, if they don't walk into a crowd and blow themselves up, they feel guilty because they're not serving out. They have a a guilty conscience, but it's a defiled conscience that the enemy has come in and created a right and wrong voice or feeling that is not based upon the Holy Spirit because Satan has hijacked their conscience. Amen? And one way that the enemy will hijack your conscience, I'm not just picking on the Muslims because the Christians do it too. Amen? Is number one, teaching the commandments of man as if they're the commandments of God. That's the first way he does it. Okay, I want to go over God's top ten. Do, you, do we have a PowerPoint in there that says God's top ten on the desktop? PowerPoint? Let's see if we have one there. If you don't see it, I'll just continue. So here's, here's God's, God's top ten. This is the commandments of God. You want to know what the commandments of God are? Here they are. Number one, and this is the ten commandments. I've modernized it a bit. It's give honor to your father and mother by treating them with respect. That's the first commandment. The second commandment is, oh, I got them mixed up a bit here, but they're all there. Do not deliberately kill a fellow human being. Don't hate people or hurt them with words and actions. Okay, don't kill. Number three, do not have sexual relationships with anything, or anything, anyone other than your spouse. God forbid sex outside the bounds of marriage. So you need to respect your body and other people's bodies. Okay, so it's talking about thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay, do not steal or take anything that doesn't belong to you unless you have been given permission to do so. Do not tell a lie about someone or bring a false accusation against another person. Always tell the truth. Number six, do not desire... Anything or anyone that does not belong to you, don't compare yourself to others, uh, longing to have what they have, which leads to jealousy, envy, and other sins. Be content by focusing on the blessings that God has given you, all right? And, you know, put God first. Anything that becomes an idol in your life is things that you put before God. And so these are basically the Ten Commandments. Say God's top ten. And these are the things that should trigger your conscience. All right? When you break one of God's top ten, 
whether you're a Christian or not, you feel guilty inside because God has written his law upon your heart. So that's a healthy thing. If you break one of God's commandments, you, you, you feel guilty a bit, so you repent. You say, God, forgive me. I'm going to get up, and I'm not going to do it again. Amen? And you begin to process through life. Does that make sense? Um, but when you violate one of these, your conscience should be triggered. And, uh, you know, when I was working at this company before, this is 20 years ago, this one guy was always Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, you know, all the time as a swear word. He was always angry. He was always using Jesus' name. So when I got upset, I started, you know, I'd walk by and be like, oh, Buddha, Hare Krishna. And I started using, and he looked at me, and, and not him, but a lot of people looked at me and said, what's wrong with you, man? Like, why are you saying that? And I said, well, I'm upset, so I'm just, I'm using these names. And they're like, why are you doing that? I said, well, wh- let me ask you this question. I said, why is it when people get angry, they use the name of Jesus as a cuss word? I never thought about that. Well, because the Bible says, thou shall not use the name of thy Lord, the Lord your God in vain. And so the enemy's triggering that in you so that you blaspheme God. I said, why don't you say Buddha? Why don't you say, you know, some other God? I don't know. I never thought about that. He didn't do it after that. It was kind of interesting. But, um, but the enemy wants to hijack your conscience, so that you trade in the commandments of God for the commandments of man. And the commandments of God are pure. How many here want someone to steal from you? Let me see your hands. Nobody. How how many here want someone to go after your spouse? Let me see your hand. How many here would like to see somebody, you know, um, uh, covet what you have? These are good things. These, These are, people say, well, we're not under the law. Yes, we're under the law because it's good and it's pure and it's holy and it keeps order. It's not a bad thing. Amen? We're still under the law. We're just not, we're not saved by the law. It leads us to Christ. Okay, so here's the thing. Mark chapter 7, verse 1 to 22. I'm going to read you a story about the Pharisees. And I want to show you what it looks like. When the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to Jesus, having come from Jerusalem, now when they saw some of the disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding to the traditions of the elders. When they come in from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like they need to wash their cups a certain way, their pitchers, their copper vessels, and their couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders, but they eat with unwashed hands? And so... Jesus is trying to teach them about the kingdom, and the Pharisees are sitting there going, I can't believe they're not washing their hands. They're sinners. They traded the commandment of God for the commandments of man. And then uh, Jesus answered and said, Well did did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as as it is written, This people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And Jesus is addressing this. You know, for laying aside the commandments of God, you hold to the traditions of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do. And so their conscience was hijacked by tradition same way today you go to certain churches and they worship a certain way or they baptize people a certain way or they have their own tradition and if you don't do it you're kind of like you're a sinner you know and it's tradition and it robs us from the power of God because God wants us to live holy he wants us to live pure from our hearts he's not into legalism what was that Amen. amen that's better And so I want to say this, the doctrines of men, they produce death. They don't produce life. And some of them that we've heard in the past is you need to worship on Saturday. If you don't worship on Saturday, then that's the true Sabbath. So you have to worship on Saturday. You can't worship on Sunday or you might not be saved. You hear stuff like this, and these are doctrines of demons. We're going to get into that in a little bit. Number two, you can't eat certain foods. And the list goes on and on and on. we got all these regulations that man has come. But what does the Bible say? Because if we go and read the Bible in context, it 
answers all of our questions. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 to 17. You guys okay with this? All right. It says this, So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink, or for not celebrating certain holy days, or new moon ceremonies, or Sabbaths. This is Paul the Apostle telling me this. Okay? For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come, and Christ himself is that reality. All of, this, all of the feasts, all the new moons, all the celebrations in the Old Testament were shadows to portray who Jesus Christ was. Guess what? Jesus is in us. We're living in Christ. These were shadows. You don't have to live under that anymore. You can live by faith. Amen? And so, so the scripture gives us this outline um, of how we should live. Don't, it says you can't eat certain foods. You can't celebrate certain feasts or holidays. You can't celebrate birthdays. There's no, like there's Christian sects that teach us stuff. All right? They have ministry philosophies that are out to lunch. <laughs> you know, um, you don't want to break the generational mold. The church has always done it this way. Don't break the mold, right? These are all traditions of men. And this creates a false conscience or an inner voice or a feeling of what's right or wrong and your conscience has been hijacked and you're living in bondage. And that's why we need to know what the scripture says. Because whom the sun sets free is... In Colossians chapter 2... I mean, we get to a place even where people, Christians, can't anymore celebrate, can't celebrate Christmas, can't celebrate Easter, can't, because, they, well, because it has pagan roots, I just can't celebrate it. But we can sanctify that by the word of God and prayer. Paul was talking to the church, and he says, hey, you can go into the temples of idols and food that's been sacrificed, you, you can bless it and eat it because you're not under that system anymore. And I don't know about you, but Christmas has, we have sanctified it. It's a time we, we celebrate the birth of Christ. We love Jesus. I know it has pagan. We don't care. We don't think about that. I've had encounters with God and with his presence, and God has spoken to me on Christmas. Anyone would agree with that? Amen. The only, the only holiday we can't justify and we can't sanctify is Halloween. We just, we have tried. We've looked at it. We've studied it. It's, a, it's an occultic holiday, so we just, we just don't go there. But as far as celebrating, God wants us to be free. Can I hear an amen? Okay, so let's, let's, let's look at this. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, reading a lot of scriptures today. Colossians chapter 2, verse 20 to 23 says, You have died with Christ, and he has, set, uh, he has set you free from spiritual powers of the world. Why do you keep on following the rules of the world, such as don't handle this, don't taste that, don't touch this? Such rules are mere human teachings. They're commandments of man about things that deteriorate when we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desire. All right? A little homework assignment for you. If you struggle with some of these traditional things, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, you can read that on your own. and Just do a study and ask God to lead you through that. But I want to say this, God's love empowers us to keep his law. God's power empowers us, his, 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 uh, his love. His love does not empower us to keep the commandments of man. It only empowers us to keep his law. Se- second way that the enemy use, it, it, it hijacks our conscience is he uses scripture out of context. He does that. And, and, and so many Christians are running around quoting verses of the Bible out of context. And actually, if you take Scripture out of context, it can bring you into bondage, not freedom. We see that the enemy knows, the, say, you know, the enemy knows the Bible better than we do. He might not understand it, but he knows the verses. And what he does is when he's tempting Jesus, look what he does to Jesus. Jesus is just baptized. He goes into the desert. He's fasting. The enemy appears and tempts him three times in Matthew chapter 4, verse 5 to 7. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point on the temple. And he said, if you're the son of God, jump off. For the scripture says, 
He will order his angels to protect you. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. That's in the Bible, guys. And the devil quotes this to Jesus. But Jesus says, the scripture also says... See, this is why we, need, we can't be biblically illiterate because you'll hear stuff, you'll hear sermons on YouTube, you'll hear things and you say, hey, that sounds pretty good and that good guy's a good communicator. I'm going to buy into that doctrine and you'll go way off and the enemy will bring you captive unless you're able to say, but the scripture also says. And look what Jesus says. You must not test the Lord your God. And he brings it back into balance. Okay. I heard a message some 20 years ago about how you can lose your salvation. And it was based on this verse here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 and 27. For if we sin willingly after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for our sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation will follow, will devour the adversaries. And I heard that scripture in I heard that, and that scripture kept coming back to me, and I was struggling in my walk with the Lord in certain areas. How many know we have some struggles? Anyone here got a struggle? Okay, we have our struggles. How many know we're pilgrims on progress, right? And so I was struggling with some certain things. I was struggling a little bit with lust. We're going back 20 years. I was struggling with lust. I was struggling, you know, um, a little bit with uh, uh, sometimes look at pornography, or I was, um, or I'd get angry at somebody. It was little things I would fall into, and, and then I would feel so guilty, and I'd come to God and say, God, please forgive me. And then I would hear this verse in my head saying, listen, you know what? You've received the knowledge of the truth. There's no longer a sacrifice for your sin. You're cut off because you've willfully sunk. And this would come in and I would literally lose sleep and I would be terrified. And I thought I lost my salvation. And for two years, I battled with this. No, does God really love me? Did I lose my salvation? Did I sin one too many times? And this is how I was thinking. And, and I remember, Camilla can remind you, and people would say, Pastor, well, I wasn't a pastor at times before I was a pastor. I'd say, man, you got such a heart for evangelism. Like, you love sharing the gospel. I wish I could be a man of God like you. And what they didn't know and what I know now is I was motivated by fear. I was afraid if I didn't share my faith, then God was going to cut me off. How many know that this thought that was being preached to me was not from God? It was a scripture taken out of context to move me out of my destiny and move me into fear and out of faith. How many hear what I'm saying? And I lived like that for a couple years. And I only wish I would have looked at the verse and saw how Jesus looked to the devil and said, yeah, but the scripture also says. And as I began to grow, and as I was accountable to others, I was brought to this verse. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 to 9. And this is what I say to the enemy now when he comes to say, you've, you know, you've missed it. I say, hey, the Bible also says, devil, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not even in us. Next verse. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful. And he's just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So to hell with that thought, because that's scripture out of context. And I'm not going to let you, devil, take my joy. I'm going to get up and I'm going to keep fighting. I'm still a pilgrim in progress. I'm moving from glory to glory. I'm going to make my mistakes, but I'm going to get up and I'm going to keep fighting. And I'm going to keep depending on the power of God in me to make me an overcomer. Amen. Amen. If you're going to clap, clap for him. Amen. I believe one of the greatest revivals in the 1903... There's a revival. How many heard of the Azusa Street Revival in in Los Angeles, California? Beautiful move of God. Amazing man of God. William Seymour was uh, an American, African-American pastor who was, I won't say he was illiterate. He could read. He was, um, but he was a man of God. He sought the Lord and he, uh, he went and he started these meetings on, on Bonnie Bray Street in Los Angeles, California. I went to visit just a little house out in Los Angeles and, it, and he preached on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. And the power of God began to fall in this little living room. And uh, people started coming from everywhere to have an encounter to, with the power of God. To the point where the porch collapsed in the front. All the people. And there was people out on the streets. And they, they couldn't contain the crowd. So they moved to this little, uh, on, to Azusa Street. And they got an old warehouse. 
and they had old barn boards across logs, and people would sit and listen as he got up behind a, uh, like an egg crate type of thing there. He would get up, and he would preach the gospel, and he would talk about the power of God. And the presence of God used to fall in that place, and miracles happened. People came from all over the world because there was creative miracles happening. People's arms were growing back. People, they had, here's a story. There's these, uh, the kids used to go around in the church, and they would pray for the, the homeless people would come in, and back then, they didn't have dental care, so all their teeth were all half rotten. And they would pray for the, and, and the new teeth would grow in, and the old rotten teeth would fall on the floor. And they, they used to sweep up the teeth. Like, this kind of stuff was happening all the time. People were getting healed. Cancers were being healed. Uh, people would call the fire department because they thought the building was on fire from the, from the outside. They saw a flame. God was moving so powerfully. But the enemy got in there. There's two things he did to destroy that move of God. William Seymour, the, the, the worship leader, loved William Seymour, and the secretary loved William Seymour, and they both wanted to marry him, and he married the worship leader. So the secretary was jealous, the spirit of jealousy came in, and she took the, the, the they had a, a mail out, uh, what do you call that, um, a mail list, and they used to send out newsletters all over the world, they'd mail them out so people could know that the revivals, had, she stole the, the, the mail list and she left the church. So people thought that the move of God had passed away, so it began to dwindle. But the other thing that happened was uh, William Seymour began to believe the scripture that I just read you out of context. That once you're sanctified and filled with the Spirit, if you sin once, you can lose your salvation. And people began to feel, the enemy began to use that, and people felt like, I messed up again, maybe God, has, God doesn't love me anymore, and I've lost my, so they began to leave, and the, the, the move of God just dwindled because the enemy hijacked a scripture and hijacked the consciences of a group of people. And out of that move, the Azusa Street Revival, many moves were born. The Pentecostal, the Pentecostal church was, was birthed, the movement of the Pentecostal church and the assemblies of God. Great movement. But some doctrinal error caused the church to come apart. All right? And so here's the thing. The question is, are we ignorant of his devices and his schemes? Do we know how the enemy um, likes to work? 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 5, I started with his verses. Now the Spirit expressly says, In later times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared, forbidding to marry, abstaining from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every, say every, creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified, how? By the word of God and prayer. All right? And there's scripture after scripture after scripture um, that we can get into. I'm going to read a few more. I told you a lot of scripture today because I want to just get a biblical foundation. First Timothy 1, verse 3 to 7, Paul warns. He says, when I left Macedonia, Macedonia, sorry, I urge you to stay there in Ephesus. He's talking to Timothy and stay with those who teach in contrary, sorry, and stop those who teach contrary to the truth. Don't let them waste their time in endless discussions of myths and spiritual pedigrees. These things only lead to meaningless speculation and they don't help people live a life of faith in God. The purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with the love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a genuine faith. Say with me, the purpose of the word is to Make me fill with the love of God that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a genuine faith. But here's the question. What if your heart has been hijacked? What do you do about it? First John chapter 3, 18 to 20. My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we're in the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. And God knows all things. And I, I tell you, sometimes you just, you just, you're too hard on yourself. 
and God's, God's trying to give you mercy. And sometimes, some, some of us, we get really hard on ourselves and we judge ourselves. And we have to come back and say, no, I'm an overcomer. I'm going to get back up. I'm going to fight the good fight of faith. Amen? And I'm going to win. And we've got to be easy on ourselves. God knows that sometimes our conscience is hijacked and the purpose of the instruction of the Word of God is that we be filled with, uh, with love. But we need to understand this, that doctrines of demons, and I could, I could list many, many moves of God, or not moves of God, but many religions that were birthed with angels, specifically Gabriel, starts a lot of religions. The angel Gabriel starts lots of religions. We know it's not the real Gabriel. It's, it's the enemy coming, Satan coming as an angel of light. Uh, but he started a lot. He started this, um, the Mormon church, Joseph Smith. This is what he said. Joseph Smith said this, the Mormon church. After I retired to my bed for the night, I betook myself to prayer and supplication to Almighty God for the forgiveness of my sins and follies, and also for a manifestation to me that I might know the state of standing before him. While I was in the act of calling upon God, I discovered a light appeared in my room which continued to increase until the room was lighter and light as noonday, when immediately a parsonage appeared at my bedside, standing in the air. I kind of freak you out, right? He had on a loose robe, and he begins to explain what, what the angel was dressed like, right? His hands were naked, and his arms were naked, and his, his wrists were naked. And he goes on and talks about how the guy looked. He says his head and neck were also bare. His whole person was glorious beyond description, and his countenance like lightning. And he began to talk to him about the Mormon faith. And Joseph Smith went from Christendom to running a cult movement, just like that. Muhammad encountered an angelic being of light. That's how the Islamic faith was birthed. Buddhism was birthed by an angel appearing. Uh, Seven-day Adventist church. There was visions of angels that came and brought truth. That is contrary to scripture. And so, the angel Gabriel is starting a lot of stuff. But we know it's not really the angel Gabriel. The scripture warns us that of, of um, Satan disguising himself as an angel of light. And uh, so, I want to just read one more thing in, in this uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 18. If we have that one, let's bring that one up. Let no one cheat you. Okay, here we are. Let no one cheat you of your reward taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. That is actually taken in context to the doctrines of men. You know, taste not, touch not, all that stuff. It's, from, it's not from heaven. It's to bring division in the body. Amen? So let's wrap this up. What we want God to do We want to be praying, God, give us discernment. Teach us to take every thought captive and teach us how to measure everything through your word. Let scripture interpret scripture. Amen? See, God's word is there to to cause us to be filled with the love of God and to have a clear conscience. That's what the scripture is there for, that we can live the life of faith and bring glory to his name. Amen? So why don't we stand and I'm going to pray. Is that too heavy? Do you guys get anything out of that? I just, I struggle saying, is that too heavy? Do you guys going to be, but here's the thing. We're living in a time where there's, there's so many different flows of how we do things. And, uh, you know, and, and at the end of the day, we've got to come back to the word of God. What's important to God? God, what's important to God is that we have a relationship, a love relationship with him. We have a love relationship with one another and we're obeying the commands of God, which is to love one another and to obey the, the big 10. Amen. So, Let's pray. Father, we come before you today, God. We thank you for your word. God, we thank you that we're a people who, um, who are loved by you, God. We're pilgrims in progress. God, right now, if the enemy has come and even brought any uh, false conscience on people where they feel condemned because of maybe a tradition that was introduced that they're not following anymore, God, that you would sever that. Lord, I pray that this week as they go that they'd be able to talk to you about it, Father, and you'd begin to reveal truth to them. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 God is good.